If I am doing, putting up a resource at this location, and I'm using post for this, it's going to decide where that lives. If I'm using a put, I have to provide some sort of identifier at the end. And put is going to replace whatever is already there with what I'm sending it. So if there's something already at 12345, that's going to get whacked, and my new resource is going to be put there. If there isn't anything there, it's going to assume I know what I'm doing and put it there. So put is the short advantage for put that people will say, always say, well, it's used to update resources, and that's true. A lot of times it will be used for that. But it's also a little more distinction. It's for creating resources in specific places. A lot of sites will not allow you to issue puts. If you send a put verb, they're going to say, eh, sorry. The way they handle updates is they make you do a post, and then make you send the idea of the thing you're posting up as an optional argument. And then they'll handle it. Their documentation is to specify which they do. Strictly speaking, they're breaking the standard. But in the case of a Flickr example I mentioned earlier, you, know, you don't want to be whacking somebody else's pictures, so that makes sense. Any questions on how put works? It's probably of the four. It's the most complicated of the four. Okay, everybody good? There's a test. All right. So if we go from probably the most complicated to the least complicated, delete. Anyone want to guess what delete does? There's no prize if you're right. It deletes. Whatever I point my URI at and I send my delete verb for, it's gone. And you want to be careful with this because there's no are you sure. It's just, okay, what now? So those are the four you're going to use. Like I said, there's others in the standard. There's one, I don't have a slide for it. Uh, it's called head, and what that really does is it's more of kind of a metadata verb. It's saying, hey, I want to do something with this resource. I'm not really sure what kind of resource it is. You can do the head verb, and it'll send you back. Okay, that's, that's a picture. It's this big. It's a JPEG. What do you want to do next? Uh, that comes up occasionally. It doesn't get used very much. But it's out there, if you, so if you guys see it, that's all it means. There's a bunch of other ones out there, too, if you want to go look them up, uh, have at it. But I, to be honest, I've really never seen anything other than these five in the wild. So they're really not anything about. Aren't we starting to see patch come around a little bit more? We're starting to see patch come around a little bit more for things we do as developers. Um, <laughs> we're not really seeing that in a lot of commercial things like uh, stock things or sports things and things like that. So yeah, that's coming up a little bit more. Um, and to be honest, I'm not super familiar with how patch works. I have to go do some more research myself. But that is something you will see. I, it might come up a little bit more in the future. But for now, these are the five you're going to, four and a half, I should say. You're really going to be worried about more than anything. Cool? All right. So that's, we've talked about how to get information back. And I've talked about all these resources like pictures and movies and all this other stuff. And that's all cool. But for the most part, as developers, we're looking at getting data back. You know, that stuff's all cool. We'll probably need to do that at some point. But right now, I need to send and retrieve data. I'm probably doing some cool ajax -y stuff on my website. Because users love that. So i got to send that data. With REST-based web services, there's two ways, really, of doing that for data. First one is plain old XML, which you might have heard referred to as POX. Now, if you've ever seen a SOAP message, how many of you guys have seen a SOAP message? Just out of curiosity. Anything, you notice anything off the top of your head between, different between that and this? This is pretty simple. This is like, maybe, if this was a SOAP message, what you see would be 2% of what's going over the wire. And I don't think I'm exaggerating at all. Um, it's small, it's compact, it passes what I, again, what I call the human test. I can put that in front of a business analyst, and if there's something wrong with my data, they're going to spot it right away. I don't have to explain this really complicated or complex or convoluted format to them. They can look at it and go, oh, okay, well, clearly you've got something goofy here with this. That's POX. That was the first way a lot of these web, or rest based web services work. It's kind of the old, original way of doing things. And if you're calling REST-based web services from .NET, it's probably where you're going to get your data from, I want to say from .NET, so it should say from C-sharp or VB. It's probably going to be the way you get things back. The reason being 
the .NET XML compiler is actually very good and very fast. You can get back JSON messages in .NET, oh, C Sharp VB, but the, compiler, the, the parsing is a little bit slower. You have to do a little bit more of the lifting on your own. It's a little bit tougher. So you're going to see this from time to time. And that's cool and it's great, but it's kind of old and it's not as used anymore. The thing that's kind of taken its place is this new thing called JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Do I have any really good JavaScript people here tonight? Yeah, okay. He's an expert. He just said he's a ninja. So if you look at this, what's something you notice about the way this is laid out and what it looks like? Associated array almost. It's it's basically a JavaScript object. Yeah. So I'm passing back literally just JavaScript. If I was going to declare, if I was just writing JavaScript, this is how I would declare this class. Exactly the same. There's no, not even really any parsing happening or serialization happening. It just, bam, it's there. This is more useful if you're calling AJAX services or REST services from your web page, otherwise known as AJAX. So you're going to see this a lot. In fact, Web API defaults to returning JSON unless you tell it otherwise. I'll show you guys that in the demo. But those are really the two ways to get data back. Uh, you will not get soap out of Web API. We'll talk a little about that at the end, too. Uh, that's a good thing and a bad thing. But those are really the two ways you're going to get data. Okay. So that all sounds really cool. So how do I write West, REST based web services in .NET? Because you all, I know, are anxious to get out of here, and you're not even going to go drink. You're just going to go home and start writing REST based web services, right? <laughs> <laughs> so more beer and scotch for me. Well, depends on what you're working with. Please, I hope nobody in here is working with earlier in 3.5. If it is, you need to get another job, seriously. Um, he's trying to get a new job. No. Um, <laughs> if you are 3.5 or later, or I should say, yeah, 3.5 or later, WCF is an option for you. And I'm going to show you kind of just as a way to, or in the first one, just as kind of a way to contrast how good Web, web API is. I'm going to show you how to do this in WCF. And there are a lot of people out there still on 3.5. Bigger companies sometimes slower to move, I get that. If you are using 4 or higher, which a lot of companies are starting to, and your boss is cool if you're using MVC, which hopefully they are because that's the new hotness. Not that web forms are, not that are all web forms. Then your option is Web API. That's going to be the focus of the demo tonight. Okay? Any questions before we get into the demo? You guys are still awake, right? I have to ask it. Okay. I have a question. Sure. In the in the context of time, like when did Web API launch? Like when was it introduced? By when was it introduced? Yeah. Uh, it came out about a year ago. It was um, so 2012. Early 12, maybe it was even the end of 11. And actually, when I say Web API, <coughs> there's a little bit of a misnomer there because how many, how many of you guys have been doing MVC applications? Okay, good. That's actually a pretty high number. MVC is, for those of you doing web forms, MVC is basically a REST implementation of ASP.NET, which will make sense hopefully when you see that demo. And the truth is, you've been able to write REST-based web services in MVC ever since it, version 1, I believe. You added an attribute to your method, to your uh, controller method, and it would return back JSON instead of whatever. So really with Web API, they just kind of formalized that whole thing. And they borrowed a little bit from uh, the Rails community in terms of kind of building around the idea of co um, convention over configuration. Right. So that will probably make sense, more sense in a few minutes. So what I want to start off first with is I want to show you guys uh, how to do this in WCF. Mostly so you'll see kind of what drove them to formalize Web API because it's kind of a train wreck in a way. What I've got here, I've got three projects. Uh, I have a directory, or I, I, we're doing a personnel directory. And the first one is this core project. And all this really is is it represents what my business core would be. I have an entity called person, and I have a personal repository 
I'm happy to be just using a dictionary for this because I didn't feel like spinning up a database, but it replicates if I'm reading or reading people from a database. You guys have probably done it 100 times like today. Not a big deal. Directory host is just a console after I'm hosting my WCF service. Again, if you've done any WCF, you've probably done that already. I'm not going to show it to you unless you really want to see it. Uh, you'll have access to this demo. That's really not a big deal. What we're more concerned with is this personnel directory at WCF, which is where my service components live. And the first one is going to be my service contract. Now, for those of you who don't know WCF, WCF operates on this idea of contracts. Everything is a contract, which is a fancy way of saying it's attribute soup. The most, first of all, I have this online. I don't know my language turned on. Notice, first of all, here, I have this service contract. That's telling the WCF runtime that this interface is going to define a web service for me. There's going to be methods that are at some endpoint, which is basically just a web address. And the methods in this contract are going to be <coughs> web methods that people can hit. I mentioned earlier uh, some issues with WCF and, and REST. By default, when, and this isn't a WCF thing really, it's a SOAP thing. One of the failings of SOAP and the reason you can't really cache SOAP things is because everything comes through with SOAP as a post. That is the verb it uses. It does use GET for metadata exchange, which is basically, if, I, if you GET against my SOAP web service, it'll send back what's called web service definition language which is a bunch of ugly XML that tells my, I, I'll run through tool of mine and then I'll create a proxy for it. But really that, that's not helpful in terms of getting there. So everything happens as a post, which is another issue with SOAP. But going through the rest of this, I see, for now I ignore the web get and the web invoke, but the rest of this in here, I'm defining my methods on my web service. In this case, everything has to be decorated with this thing called operation contract. <laughs> That is the basic WCF attribute that says this method is going to be exposed as a web service method. And you can see I have get people, get person, get people gets all the people, get person gets a specific person, um, post means create a person. I try to use REST friendly names in this so you guys can kind of see the, the corollary, update person. So that's the basics of WCF web service. If I didn't have the web gets the web invokes in here and I ran this, this would set up as a SOAP-based web service. So all in all, it's really not difficult to create a SOAP-based web service in WCF. People get bogged down in configuration. For the most part, if you just use the system generator one and leave it alone, it's fine. Uh, the other contract I want to show you guys in WCF is this idea of a data contract. And you can see here I have a person class. I've had to decorate this with a data contract. And this basically tells WCF runtime hey, you need to serialize this to go over the wire. And for those of you who have worked with the XML serializer, it's similar to that. The, the big difference being, in the XML serializer, that was what's called an opt-out serializer, which means if you just put serializable at the top of your class as an attribute, it's going to serialize every public attribute, or every public attribute in that class. You have to tell it, uh, ignore certain ones if you don't want to serialize. The WCF one works differently. You have to tell it specifically which members to serialize, which is why I have data member on all of these attributes. The other difference being in the XML serializer, I have a lot of freedom to affect how my XML document is going to look after it's serialized. Do I want these as attributes? Do I want them as elements? Uh, the data contract serializer is pretty much its way or the highway. You either like it or you're tough. Tell your story walking. But it's very, it compared, especially compared to the XML serializer, it is blazingly fast. So if you don't care what your data looks like, this will beat it any day of the week. So that's basically how we got the SOAP-based web service. Now to make this a REST-based web service, I had to do a couple things. You'll see these, some of these other attributes in here. This web get. Here's, I have a web get attribute here, and I have a web invoke here and here. I have another one up here too. What these are doing, are these are telling the WCF runtime that, in this case, I have a web get here. So I'm going to have this get people method, and I want that to respond to a get verb. If I get a 
someone comes in on the URI, and, I'll, and I have to identify there's a REST-based URI in my configuration. But if something comes in on that URI with the GET, I want it to route to this method. Uh, you'll see this other argument here called URI template. So what happens is in WCF, we'll have to create this configuration file. We specify there what we want our address to be. And you can say this HTTP binding here that tells it, hey, it's a respite endpoint. So what happens over here is with the URI template, what I'm saying is take whatever my URL is that I specified that config file and append this. So if that get verb and the URI matches that template, then route it to this method. So it's basically a templating engine. The next method down is get person. I have people, and then I have whack, and I have this little uh, templating placeholder called user ID. So what that's looking for is my URI, whack people, whack a number of some sort. And it's going to route that here. As long as, as long as my templates are correct, it'll route it. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind when you're doing this, you'll notice the spelling and the casing are exactly the same between these two. If you, I found this out the hard way uh, about two years ago when we spent a day and a half trying to code web service. <laughs> if the capitalization is not consistent, it will not map correctly. And it will, you'll just get no data for your arguments. It'll, it'll find the method and it'll route to the method. You just won't get any argument there. Um, so that was, don't do that again. I'm not, so just know from my mistake, that's an issue. So that's fine with get. Get gets its own attribute because I think it gets used a lot more than the other REST verbs. So they get a web get that they can not share. The REST room uses web invoke, as you can see here. And in notice we have a URI template like we have with the get, but we also have to define a method. And in this case, we have a method called post, and a method called put, and a method called delete. Okay? What these are doing is these are saying, match this to whatever verb is coming in. So if I use this URI and I have a post verb, it's going to match it to this method. Put gets mapped here, delete gets mapped here. That's great because I can use any verb in the standard and I can even, please don't do this, I can even make up my own verbs as I, if I want, but that would be a very bad thing, so you shouldn't do it. The problem, again, becomes this is a magic string. And it's prone to misspelling because human beings type these. So 